All right, so welcome into the live stream today. It is going to be a hot one. We're going to be jumping into Bitcoin and also what I think is a FUD war that seems to have begun. And there's a lot of different pressures that we often track here on the show, but I'm always looking at not only the macro environment, what's happening in the media, the social aspect of things. Obviously, as you guys know, we study a lot of sentiment. We'll dive into all this today and get in deep. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Let's get into Bitcoin because I think a lot of you are looking for that pre-ETH merge run on whether it's Bitcoin or even Ethereum itself and what these uh, scenarios might be painting into the chart themselves. There's a lot of news here that obviously kind of lines up very well with understanding are we getting a little bit of a FUD run on what's happening in crypto? And this is something you guys know that I talk about often is that I do believe that there is... um, we'll call them forces at work. Whether you look at manipulative uh, elements within the market itself, or you look at other aspects from the media organizations that are in and around Bitcoin, as well as the traditional kind of M5M, which is the mainstream five media uh, that goes into it. I want to jump to a first article here, and this coming over from Yahoo Finance. Stock market new Uh, News live updates. Uh, This, of course, is stock rise as investor uh, waits, await rate clarity from the Fed. There's a few things that are happening right now. Obviously, we saw a big dip in the S&P, but they are on edge, meaning the traditional investors uh, over the central bank's annual symposium. This is the one that uh, Senator, or excuse me, Senator, (laughs) uh, Chairman Powell went to Jackson Hole and uh, put together basically officials within the Fed to kind of get ready for what will happen later this year, especially as we start to lean into the back half. Um, This is going to be interesting to watch. I do think that, and this was from a statement from the uh, piece here from analyst Ross Mayfield, I do think that all of their jawboning and hawkishness over the past couple of weeks is starting to show up. This is the thing that we talked about here on our own show over the past couple of weeks with a lot of the macro analysts here. But you uh, you still have a market that I'm not sure quite believes that they'll stick to it as the economy slows throughout the year. And this is the thing that we've talked about uh, time and time again. You guys know that we believe that the Fed is not going to pivot. We think they will start to and continue to put pressure on the market to get inflation under control. Now, there's a lot of macro uh, elements that really play from a global aspect that I think has a lot more Uh, indicators and pushes from where the Fed's position is, uh, for sure. At the end of Fed's Wyoming meeting, the traders will tune in for remarks. Uh, Chair Powell, of course, on the next policy announcement, this is September 21st, will, uh, coming September 21st, will result result in possibly another uh, 75 basis point hike or an eased increase uh, down to about 50 basis points. Will be the question mark, I think, overall as to whether or not we'll see those two elements play out in the overall interest rate um, play. If you look to this Bloomberg uh, tweet right here, stocks and other risk assets have a chance to rally if Powell delivers a nuanced message at the Jackson Hole Symposium. I am still believing that this is a lot of wishful thinking around where Powell is right now. My guess is that they have already started to analyze some of the data coming in. Obviously, we did see a lighter CPI print here from or in August from the July numbers. And the real question is, what is that number going to look like in early September for the August numbers? And I think the scenario is, and you've heard me say this many times, is that there is a bit of a lagging element here that is starting to showcase itself that will start to continue to put more pressure on the Fed to hold strong on how they go through the um, overall correction course of being able to get inflation under control. I think this is a big factor that plays into this. And all of this does affect Bitcoin. It does affect the potential of not only Bitcoin itself, but the altcoins that kind of trail along it. And especially, I think, could have a little bit of effect on even the Ethereum merge. Imagine this right now. You've got Powell coming back. This will the Ethereum merge, if it happens, and there's some things that I'll talk about here in a minute around that, but if it happens, uh, it will be right there smack dab in the middle of a CPI print and the Fed FOMC meeting at the end of the month. To me, that's a very, very precarious situation because if we do print a higher CPI or we get any other indicators, then you have a lot of people looking at that market and whether or not they're going to go to safe havens to try to precede what could happen in late September. 
Along with that, here coming in from Financial Times, investors priced in a $130 billion loss in the China developer dollar bonds. This again gets into the Chinese issue around um, investment property, and you can kind of see what's happening here. Pricing in almost $130 billion in losses on Chinese property. Uh, the dollar debt on mounting worries that the country's housing market will face a protracted crisis unless Beijing steps in with a large-scale bailout, which could happen. Uh, it is something that uh, Beijing, well, China uh, has done before in terms of being able to stabilize their economy. So it's not outside of the realm of possibility. The issue more at uh, play right now is the size in which this affects the Chinese uh, environment or uh, economy, but also the strategies in which they'd have to play in, in terms of the rest of the economy from a business standpoint. In other words, if they have too much help and support, what does that do to the rest of the economy itself? Two thirds of more than 500 outstanding dollar bonds issued by Chinese developers are now priced 70 cents on the dollar. This is not good with 30% discount. Rising pressure on the market comes a year after the Evergrande issue, which we reported on here. Uh, and that, to me, was the precursor to what we're seeing right now in the Chinese market. Uh, industry headwinds and negative news. It's very clear that many more developers offshore, uh, including dollar bond prices, have fallen sharply, obviously, since last year. Back to my point, not something that we like to you know, kind of say, hey, we, we talked about this before, but it is a, a strategy that we have been very consistent about is that this will have a trailing effect on the Chinese overall environment in terms of their economy. And this to me has maybe one of the bigger plays on where this could have effect on the U.S. economy, but more importantly, even the European economy, which all of those three major economies are very critical to the future of a lot of risk assets, including cryptocurrencies, which is why I still believe that we are still due for a little bit more of a downturn. Pending home sales, of course, have also slipped another percent in July, but realtors are saying, hey, but maybe the market's at a bottom or close to a bottom. I, I can't even imagine a, a realtor saying that because it's barely even got here. You know, we are at a position, yes, almost two full points on interest rate hikes, you know, since in past the, the 90 days. A lot of people that purchased homes 90 days ago were in still in the threes and fours. So it is a big difference in terms of the market itself. But here's the thing that I think real estate is not counting on. And that is that high net worth individuals are trying to figure out where do they put assets. And with the dollar so strong right now, the euro weakening and the issue of a lot of securities not necessarily showing a upside yet, I think you have a lot of people sitting on cash. So I don't necessarily look at real estate, which people want for liquid, when you look at liquid assets, cash being king, real estate may not necessarily be the one which starts to put some pressure on demand and demand will be a big one. So pending home sales, measure of signed contracts, existing homes dropped 19% in July. 19%, that is huge. Also, the figure has fallen eight of the past nine months as rising mortgage rates. This is not something that I think we're gonna continue to see um, a slowdown on. I think we're going to see a speed up on this market correction for sure. Higher rates published the typical mortgage payment up 54% from over just a year ago. If I mean, up 54%, come on, people. You, you just cannot assume that this market is especially going into the fall when we're going to con see continued pressure on securities because of lacked earnings coming out of some of the big S&P people uh, for sure. Uh, mortgage rates have been climbing steadily since this year, peaking in June, uh, dropping slightly in July, uh, and then also regionally pending home sales uh, in the Northeast. This is about 2% off the month. Midwest was 2.7% and are down 13.4% year over year. So again, a big drop uh, overall, I think, in general of where the housing markets. And you've heard me say this before, is that the scenario of trailing indicators for a recession that leads us into recessions are three things. One, of course, is going to be housing, which is usually the first one of the three. The second will be the scenario that plays out in the job market, more jobs lost because of lackluster earnings that happen in Q3 and Q4, layoffs will continue to flow. And then final uh, nail in the coffin is uh, obviously the credit crunch that will be impending because people will resort to credit 
to be able to sustain what they're doing overall. And I think that's a big one right here. More news about housing market uh, taking, but realtors are obviously confident that the uh, bottoms are um, pretty much at hand. This guy says, sure, here's where we see this. Here's uh, Seamont's supply in new homes, new homes under construction, and Fed rate. What we'll soon see is a record number of homes for sale, which is the big one right here. And I think that is the factor. When you look at Fed rate climbing right here, you look at the potential of where new homes under construction are going, and then the amount of new homes, monthly supply of new homes, all climbing up there at the top. So again, larger supply, less demand, housing glut problem. All those kind of things start flowing into where this goes. And, and again, this is just one of those things that these are the elements that play into it. And what to me is concerning is the kind of FUD that we're seeing in the market in general that's starting to put some pressure, not only securities, but I do think it's starting to put some pressure even on where the you know high risk assets, we'll call them crypto, uh, are currently setting right now. What's intriguing to me is that Bitcoin has been able to hold steady while all of this has been happening right under its noses. So very interesting scenario here. Euro uh, falls par- below the parity with the dollar. Uh, the impact is pretty big. There's a couple of points I want to hit, hit on here to show you guys. Uh, this is the first time in 20 years, uh, inning a one one exchange rate with the U.S. currency that we've fallen under. Euro slide underlies the foreboding, uh, which is the 19 uh, European countries using the currency as they struggle, obviously, with the energy crisis. This is going to be a big factor this fall, uh, much bigger than I think a lot of people are looking at. And it means that Europe's American currencies are now worth about the same amount. Un, very unusual uh, for this. And also the exchange rate can be a verdict on the economic prospects in Europe as a whole, which I think is the bigger scenario. Because remember, if you're trying to ship to Europe, you're a supplier, supply chain gets hit with this. We look at how the dollar, even the dollar value, though, in some cases, uh, when it's outperforming against the euro, is not necessarily a good thing for the global economy. High energy prices also record inflation or blame. Europe is also far more dependent on Russian oil and natural gas uh, than the U.S., uh, and then they have, obviously have to keep the industry hunting and, um, and running. So they've got to generate a lot of power. And you've got a scenario right now where Nord Stream, uh, meaning the pipeline that pretty much supplies most of the gas to Europe, including Germany, which is one of the kingpins of the euro, uh, the EU, is under, and I would say under duress in general, but the likelihood is we don't really know how this is going to play out through the fall. And that's what we're getting ready to go into, September, October, just around the corner. So very interesting right now. Eurozone inflation, of course, hitting record highs at 8.9%, again, as energy prices are soaring. And I think at some point, European European citizens are just going to get fed up with this and just look at these sanctions. Because you notice, if you look at some of the sanctions that have already started to be lifted with things like just... um, well, I mean, there's a lot happening in the food side of things, and I think it won't be long before we start to see a lot of pressure from uh, the citizens of Europe, especially around some of the countries that are going to be faced with these kind of scenarios playing into this. So Eurozone, Eurozone hitting 8.9%, closing the gap on its uh, UK's 9.4%. Um, this is dearer energy, which was blamed for the lion's share of the increase. Uh, this is in terms of the fuel increase from 86 in June. Uh, the fallout, obviously, from uh, Russia and its invasion with Ukraine. Um, there is kind of an interesting point here, and I just want to showcase something here. It's kind of interesting. However, analysts said the recent recovery was likely to evaporate as high prices reduce flows, Russian gas, supply chain problems, cause mild recession. Again, this is very important because, as you guys know, there's two major markets for cryptocurrencies in general. Um, and what's ironic is, a good example is our number one city, right now that follows our own channel, and this is being crypto and investment technology, is London. And this is a good example. Then you jump to New York, Chicago, Singapore, um, Sydney, et cetera. And this is a factor I feel like when we look at Europe in general, these are some of the factors that if we start to see more pressure in Europe, we could see more pressure on assets in the crypto space for sure. Now, you look at many eurozones that economies are continuing to grow in the second quarter. Now, many people will say, well, wait a minute, inflation is up, but yet an economy is growing. How could that be? How could that be? Well, it's very simple. It's called credit. 
And that's where you get into consumer credit crunches when we start to see credit playing into it when an economy is down, but yet we still see growth in the environment. It's not because there's new cash going in. It's because credit is entering the market. And that itself is a problem. And if you look at this right here, total household debt surpassed $16 trillion in Q2 of this year. Mortgage auto loan and credit card balances all have increased. This is something that we will most likely see the Fed looking at more and more around how this is going to play out. And because of this, uh, I believe that we'll still continue to see some more pressure coming in. I was looking at the max. This is from Fred, which is uh, the St. Louis Fed. I was looking at the max on um, the overall household debt to GDP for the U.S. Now, uh, this goes back all the way into 2008. Remember the 2008 housing crash. Um, and that was pretty much the height of a lot of inflation and also a correction in the marketplace. Credit maxed high right here in terms of household debt. We started to get it under control. No problems. Everything's moving smooth from 2014 all the way up to right here. Boom. COVID hits. We had that big spike. A little bit of a downturn. This is where, where we saw a lot of the markets reacting. All-time high on the stock market all-time high in the crypto markets, and then wham, we are right back at $80 billion. So I think this is uh, going to be a factor that plays into uh, the future of where credit is really going to be showcasing as a problem in Q3, Q4, uh, as we start to see this play out, for sure. Don't forget, by the way, guys, uh, you got to like the video, because this is one of the things that really helps one, get people out there to start learning about cryptocurrencies in general. Understand these assets are maybe as not as big of a risk as what I think a lot of people kind of, you know, insinuate that they are. When you look at the performance of what's happened with Bitcoin and just in general crypto assets, and I think the other scenario that's playing into this right now is the amount of legislation FUD and also banking FUD that's going to start playing into this in the most likely short term. It could be a scenario where this is very short played because of the ability to, uh, for, we'll just call them the powers that be, to try to restructure how the market might respond and give them an entry point. Big stuff could be happening. The only way this happens is if you like the video. By spreading that word, you're getting it out to others who will find this because of the algorithm here on YouTube. So make sure and smash that like button. Also, drop a few questions in over on the side. We'll try to get to as many of those. The poll is live right now, so make sure and respond to that poll too because we love to see your, your feedbacks on what you think is causing price action on Bitcoin. Let's talk about this one, Bloomberg. This is, uh, this is something I follow very closely. Broom, Bloomberg has created a new tab right here. It's the crypto tab. And one thing that I've followed with Bloomberg uh, religiously is how they've guided their news points in very unique ways with very interesting timing. That's all I'll say. Banks' crypto exposure capped by Canadian regulators in new rules. Now, this starts to get into OSFI. Guidance appears to, be, guidance appears to encompass most cryptocurrencies. So real question is, is how deep did uh, Mr. Orland take this uh, in terms of research? Uh, but right now, insurers must limit their exposure to crypto assets to a small fraction of their capital under new interim rules. Interim rules. Again, I think this is a no story, but instead it has made front headlines and it really starts, in my opinion, starts to put a little bit of pressure on the Canadian market and the Canadian investors because I think this is going to play out uh, very interesting. So their financial firms needs to, this is what you would have to do in the interim rules. Uh, you'd have to notify the office of the superintendent uh, of their gross exposure uh, to type two crypto assets, which are under their new regulation, would likely encompass most currencies, most cryptocurrencies, exceeding 1% of their tier one capital. Uh, this is what the regular is kind of talking about. We've talked about this before, too, on where these tier levels happen. Have some similarity in Canada, but uh, we, and this is something you guys have heard me say, is I'm watching Canada very closely because I feel like it is a leader ironically, a leader in the, uh, especially in the DeFi markets and where that might go, but especially uh, in the kind of the new evolution of where finance is going to be moving in, in the future for sure. Uh, firms also need to notify OSFI in their total net short positions on these assets uh, that exceed 0.1 of the tier capital 
and these, these rules right now are effective in the second quarter of 2023 coming up. So again, that tells me that we're probably not going to see much sweeping regulation in Canada, which could be a good thing because uh, we need to guide this, I feel like, from uh, the U.S. side of things, at least in being able to get a global uh, sense of where this might go, which will be interesting because uh, we have a midterm coming up, and a lot of play in that midterm is essentially going to kind of set the road for how regulation may play out. So watch who wins these midterm elections very, very closely. And um, like there's several Congress Watch uh, websites out there where you can look at your own uh, representatives and take a look at their positions. And many of them are starting to develop positions on cryptocurrency. I'm doing some deep dive research, our team right now on a lot of the candidates that are moving this direction and how many are really going toward a potential for uh, pro crypto or um, you know against crypto. So we'll kind of take a look at that. Bitcoin strategists now also see charts signaling another downward move. This is something that we've talked about again. Um, you know, in general, I think the technicals and this is if you look at our uh, piece that we've done with we do with crypto or with uh, Gareth here on the charts every couple of weeks. Gareth and I are pretty much aligned is that we will see some downtrend. There is some opportunities here where we could see some slight little runs. And this is something that we've talked about many times. But in the overall, the potential of seeing a sub 20 is real. And it is one thing that, that we are definitely looking for in terms of a possibility. Largest cryptocurrency by, currency by market value is down more than 50%. Obviously, uh, this year recently has been sitting in a range around 19 to 25. And we all know that. But the token is also struggling in recent months as the Federal Reserve raised its rate and so on. This is where it gets a little bit uh, fuddy to me is the sense that I feel like when you look at the overall performance of where Bitcoin has been going, and in some cases, some of the altcoins, and, and even Ethereum when it ran up to 2000, the opportunity, these are all real case scenarios, which we knew, and if you follow this space close enough, you understand that we were gonna get these kind of things. So I think in reality, Crypto has performed pretty well in comparison to what's happened in the stock market and in traditional finance. So I think it's still yet to um, be fudded out uh, on its own. Here's another one from Bloomberg right here. Disastrous record of celebrity crypto endorsements. And again, I mean, this has got all the key. I mean, it's Tom Brady up here, for God's sake. You got, you got crazy. I mean, this is the kind of we, Reese Witherspoon, Matt Damon. All these guys. So this is kind of their play is that there has been a bit of a downturn overall. And if you look at their, I mean, they've got a whole like trading card on this, the price reaction. Fans got in when uh, the ads debuted, Bitcoin plummeted 35%. I mean, to me, this tells me you're showcasing when a market is in a downtrend and trying to blame a celebrity for, for sponsoring a product or not even a product, but a vision and picking the worst ca case in point to be able to showcase the performance. So to me, this is just um, this is just crazy. I mean, here you got Tyson. Of course, you have to go put it in with Tyson, 95% dip. Then you got Withers Witherspoon right there, slumped 75% since the partnership that she announced uh, with World of Woman NFTs. This is the kind of stuff I'm talking about is go ahead and, you know, just un unclothe the market at its worst case ever. You do this with any asset class out there, gold, securities, bonds, doesn't matter. You know, the likelihood, the difference is, is that celebrities are gonna be a big part of this because crypto in general is a part of pop culture. And that I think is the biggest crux of the matter, especially with the traditional finance sites because there is not a fundamental model in which it can be measured. That creates a big problem for guys like Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, all those guys. Let's go to Bloomberg TV. We'll listen up to hear what Mike Allred had to say. This was an interesting um, point that he's talking about price is going to be a real issue uh, when it comes to crypto mining. This is uh, Mike Allred uh, talking about this. And remember, Mike is yeah. So I mean, look, a, if you're in Europe uh, right now, I don't, I don't envy you at all. And I think this, <laughs> this speaks to geographic diversity as well. The miners that I think have the best future are going to be able to operate in multiple different jurisdictions, so that if they are experiencing either regulatory issues or power price issues in a given market, they're able to shift uh, their machines and their production um, from environment to environment to take advantage of any arbitrage that, that could exist there. 
Um, so power prices are going to be a real issue, um, particularly in places where there are supply chain related issues like in Europe. Uh, whereas Canada, and I think most of North America broadly, looks pretty good because we have sort of an oversupply of renewable energy. In the panhandle alone of Texas, there's something like 20 gigawatts of excess power that's basically not used because there's no way to get that power down to the load centers uh, yeah. down into the south. That That's the power that's being soaked up by Bitcoin miners, and we don't expect the price of that to go up astronomically simply because there's so much of it. All right. So what uh, what they were really hitting Yeah, so I mean, look, if, you saw, if you're in Europe if you saw a lot uh, right of now, I don't... I, that real quick. So when you see a lot of of this, uh, and, and let's cut back to this because I want to kind of showcase this right here. This is the example that I'm talking about right here is just this massive showcase of how underperformance and in reality, the likelihood, if you put this in with some of the top tech innovation stocks, compare that up to the mining stocks, we'd have the same kind of scenario. So it's almost, almost as if that they vilify what's happening in this space. And that to me can only mean one thing, and that is that we're looking at a potential entry into the point of traditional capital, or we're seeing some sort of potential gateway into this from a legislative standpoint that could start to change the whole cycle of how this investment class is going to be treated in the future, in the near future. That will all, of course, depend on the SEC, what's happening with Ripple, and eventually, whether it's the SEC or the uh, CFTC that really falls in favor of who's going to be governing this. I still think, though, that we're going to be dealing with its own, an, its own entity, meaning the digital assets, security regulators, will eventually become its own entity. I just don't necessarily see that this is going to be happening here. Again, don't forget, put some questions in over on the side. We'll get to the poll here in a second. Uh, I want to jump into the last thing, and I know a lot of people are talking about this, a uh, couple of the, the points here. This came, of course, coming from Cointelegraph. Ethereum, um, <laughs> Ethereum merge in trouble. Developers find bugs ahead of plan. Basically, again, another FUD topic of uh, that Ethereum is not going to make the merge. Now, you understand my theory is this isn't a bad thing. It's I feel I'm, I'm saying that this didn't happen, meaning they said, sure, there was bugs, but it was immediately fixed. So this is something that does occur in, in the stage development of any major software update. Think of it like software updates if you're thinking about software development. Um, I do anticipate that we're going to see possibly a delay, but that to me is not FUD. To me, that is normal technology advancement. Now, have they had enough time? If they hit the time, to me, that would be a huge, it would, more so a win of accomplishment by the Ethereum team to be able to hit that date and be able to stay with it. If they do that, this to me is a huge sign that cryptocurrency and more importantly, Ethereum could be on a track that is maybe unknown of what its potential future is in the future. Because this, I think, plays into not only the psyche of investors, but also I think in the trust of how investors look at something like Ethereum as an asset uh, for this particular asset class itself. Let's just remember this, guys, and this is always one that I like to bring back up. Uh, this is what Bill Gates got wrong about the internet in the 1990s. A lot of this has the same framework right now. If you look at past predictions, good reminder, something that seems crazy now will be the, uh, be the rage in this view is five or 10 years. What were they talking about? They were talking about the internet. Similarly, it seems cutting edge may end up on the cutting room floor. No one knows better than Bill Gates. This was in 1997. Uh, that was the year that the millionth dot-com name was registered, and some influential members of the tech industry uh, were very slow to understand what the World Wide Web would be, and it might be a pretty big deal. So this is exactly where we're dealing with in blockchain and Web3, is we are in the same point. Now, we're in the early stages of it, which is you know good for you guys, because you're, if you're watching our channel, it means you are the early adopters. You are in that pre-bell curve cycle of adoption. And we're going to see, I think, a very interesting um, scenario. So a lot of these investors that are naysayers of where this technology is going, a lot of the Peter Schiff's and the guys like that of the world, they're going to realize that the future of technology is built on blockchain. The future of technology is going to be Web3 and how blockchain will be integrated in all of that good stuff. We're going to get to some questions. I do want to uh, remind you guys, we've got a new product here on the show. If you guys, and this is something we just recently opened up, if you want to become a PBN premium affiliate, you can actually participate now 
in uh, putting out the word. And that is mostly for our crypto power index. It's really easy to get started, super sign up. Uh, it's, and you can build your own affiliate market. So maybe you're doing this out there with some other people. Uh, we have now made this available for all of what we're doing in terms of the mastermind courses, as well as the mastermind group and the crypto power index, all available now out there. We give you your own tools so you can go grab assets here. You'll get a, a welcome letter and then uh, assets that we provide you uh, that you guys can use. So there's the power index, the mastermind. Here's the best thing if you are an affiliate. And even if you're not an affiliate, try to find somebody that is because this is the only place that we actually discount these, ser these services. It's the only place where you can actually get one. So get a code from one of the affiliates and you'll be able to get a discount on any of those tools, including the annual passes, uh, including our coursework, all that good stuff. Let's go and jump over to the poll real quick and see how this one uh, turned out. All right, what effects on Bitcoin price more? Media FUD, 30%, wow. Altcoin dominance, not a big one. And then of course, global and macro inflation. And you guys are, you know, you guys are way ahead of the curve here. And I think you understand the scenario that, that we are faced with right now is real in the sense that for this market to really get to the next level, we got to get through this economic problem. And the economic problem is high inflation. It is a correction of the overprinting. Uh, and it is a correction of the overall society impact that we're dealing with both in Europe and China, which is causing its own problems. But more importantly, it's being guided by what's happening here in the U.S. So a big one. Let's jump to a few questions as well. Will there be another ETH run in the lead up proposed to the merge date? So here's my theory, Garçon, is that if we don't see a, any kind of indicator here that there is a slowdown, I anticipate ETH is in the middle of kind of a mini run right now back up because it's above 16 again. Um, and if you guys have been with our mastermind, we we're kind of picking slots of where to buy. Um, and we were kind of raising and, and repositioning because we were looking at 1350 as kind of the bottom and 1450, 1550 was a new range. So that is something that we are looking at. Uh, I am in and still in some short trade or some uh, swing trades as well. So if you're in on Cosmos on that trade, maybe on, on Solana, we're on a trade right now. But I do think that we'll see a bit of a run here. The question mark is timing. And I mentioned it earlier in the show. Timing right now because of the CPI print, CPI will be another big factor that will cause some, some stress. The uh, meeting later this week from kind of the what's happening in Wyoming with the Fed, because it'll give us at least some more indicators. I still think there's going to be pressure, which again, could push markets back down, meaning Bitcoin and ETH. NFTs, uh, Majestic Fox, uh, NFTs and Metaverse is a scam, except for music and clips. I don't know, listen, that's exactly what people said about the internet. This is just like internet 2.0. Um, it's exactly what people said about the internet. I think that metaverse has potential. It is super early. It is in the era in which most people don't understand the use case for it. And most people cannot understand it because most of the companies that are developing won't be around. It'll be the next layer of companies that develop along with brands that will eventually measure Web3 into the metaverse and what that means, whether it is gaming, NFTs, or other use cases. Uh, but I think whoever comes up with the utility that is going to be a killer app for it, including if it's meta, you know, great, their whole environment may end up doing it, or it will be their last leg. We'll see how all that plays out. It's very early, but I'm never a naysayer because I've seen this picture before. And back to my point when I made it a little earlier about Gates, is that even the best will miss this. And that is a question mark for sure. Uh, let's see here. Um, all right, so Brian Miller, uh, be careful of circulating supplies on your alts. Many are releasing supply into the market, dumping on us. Matic, uh, Graph, uh, just to be aware. Okay, that's interesting. Some of these are, um, are moving down. Of course, even though uh, there's been a handful of them that have been kind of somewhat flat here over the last few days. Uh, this is Road Rage. Uh, what do you think of the catalyst will be for the sub 20 Bitcoin drop? I think it will be a uh, more than negative um, situation with jobs, a, a higher uh, problem with jobs, which that data will come in in September. A 75 basis points uh, end of September and uh, S&P uh, third quarter numbers coming in really bad. 
because uh, that's going to put some pressure on all the market, including the ones that are trying to liquidate stocks and hence possibly go into other all, uh, asset classes to pull money to do margin calls. So it's a tough one. Five years time, we'd be smiling. I, I would agree with that, uh, Wesley. It's just a matter. It's not timing on the market. It's time in the market. Okay. Brum, let's go here. I know a lot of you might not like Warren Buffett, but he said he buys into companies on what he thinks their worth is, not how much they are personally uh, think they're all top altcoins are worth something there. What was that? Or, or, or worth uh, 20, 20 bucks, maybe? Um, not sure where that, that one's going. I like Warren Buffett. I think he was a great investor in his day, but I think it's a new day. I think there's a new cycle of investors, a new process for investing. And uh, quite honestly, I think there's a new asset class for investing and it's changing the dynamic that if you don't move with that, it's not that those investments that he had, but those are 20, 30 year old companies that sure they've had their time in the sun, but they don't last forever. Everything always has a change. Uh, VZ fact, uh, buy in the red days, weekly and hold. I know this is history playing the same guy and this is, as they did with gold. So I, I'm a big uh, proponent of that. Um, I really like doing the, the super bloody day buys, uh, because it's the hardest to do is when Bitcoin is just falling off the map. Same thing with Ethereum or other year altcoins. And you're going, mm, I'm going to buy it while it's, you know, down 22%. That's a hard decision to make for most investors. But if you're convicted on a particular project and the same thing with stocks, there's some stocks that move on this, uh, rally just like this. So, you know, it's something to play. For sure. Uh, Garcon, uh, what does your personal portfolio look like uh, at the moment, PB? All right, so I'm still heavy on Bitcoin. Uh, I sold 75% of my ETH, moving up to 2,000, looking for a lower entry point. It came. I started doing uh, a couple more acquisitions. I still am looking for a lot of cash on the side, looking for opportunities. I'm going to uh, short trades with uh, Solana, or swing trades with Solana, Cosmos, uh, I have a handful of, of tokens that I'm holding longer, which are things like Matic, Gala, Sand. Um, what else do I have? It's a handful of other uh, altcoins that I like, you know, you know long-term wise. What I would refer to you in is our portfolio of our top 20, our portfolio for our top 20 investments in a bear run of what to look at. We have a whole playlist on that. So check the channel uh, and check the, um, the playlist out. I might be able to show it to you. Uh, show show it to you guys if I can pull up the YouTube right here. <clears throat> All right, so if you go to the YouTube channel, just scan down here. I think it's, yeah, it's right here. So the 20K by the dip crypto portfolio. What we did with this uh, was pretty cool. We, we broke down uh, a variety of assets in different classes. So you can kind of figure out what class you like. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a layer one guy. I'm a layer two guy. I like uh, utility tokens. Uh, payment tokens, whatever it might be. And then we broke those down with experts and did a full analysis. We ranked them on sentiment and then we invested in them. Some of them we've invested in, sold in and out of them. Uh, we've done five investments so far and are up in that portfolio. I think right now about 18% overall. Brendan, BTC lower or higher, doesn't matter. It's a win-win either way. I think you're right, Brendan, because when you look back on this period of time, four years, three years, five years, whatever that number is uh, from today, you will look back and say, man, I bought Bitcoin in the 20s. I bought Bitcoin on its low of 17K. And you're going to look like a savant because of where it will be. And I think that is uh, dead on with what you're pointing at. Sometimes we get over overzealous on this, you know, $300 move here, $200 move here on Bitcoin. And in reality, it is just finding those good days of where it drop, drops down six, 8%, grab, scoop some up, wait for another to hit and do the same thing. You know, rinse, repeat. Uh, the pimped. Let's go here. I think macros will have the greatest influence uh, until Bitcoin stops being traded like a risk asset. For sure. Uh, but, you know, macros right now are having a lot of uh, impact right now on the S&P 500. And nobody ever considered those to be risk assets. Did you not? All right, fight away. I've heard this. Uh, I've heard there is an ETH killer, a saw killer, and so on. I've never heard another coin called the Bitcoin killer. 
I would agree with you, Jen, is that Bitcoin is still king. Uh, there has not been, but one day there will be. I know the maxis will blasphemy, blasphemy, you're saying there, Baron. But one day, uh, the evolution changes. And at some point, it may be 20 years from now, but at some point we will see a blockchain, a blockchain revolution. And, you know, it's just technology. Technology moves with cycles and cycles and adoption will curve and Bitcoin could be at a place that will be replaced in the future. I'm not saying that it's not impossible or that it cannot happen because I'm very open uh, to things like that. Uh, last question here, Harley, uh, whoever voted on the poll with macro global option doesn't understand that in order for Bitcoin to move, it needs global adoption. Totally agreed. Yes, global adoption is going to happen. But what do we have to happen first? We got to take the medicine and the medicine is getting out of these economic woes before we start to see global adoption occur. Also, all of this, I still feel is a planned agenda. And you've heard me talk about this structured agenda is what I call it. And this is something that I think has an implementation around the globe that potentially could be replacing the monetary aspect of our entire system. And that means maybe an opportunity for whether it's CBDC or we do truly see a digital dollar take place and change over what we will see as reserve world currency. So it's going to be interesting. Bitcoin and what you're seeing right now is right there in the game. That's the beauty of it. It's right there at the cusp of everything that's happening. All right. So you guys are tuned in over on the podcast right now. Thanks for listening in. We appreciate that. But you missed a live stream. And that is the thing that we really kind of hark on here on the channel is try to get as many people over to the live streams. It does help the algorithm and it also helps you guys be able to get in front of everybody. So sometimes you can catch a move before if you're catching these live streams. So jump over to YouTube, subscribe to the channel, hit the little bell notification. That way you'll get a notification when we do go live and you'll cycle in some of our content so you can kind of cover up with uh, some education around different projects, see CEO interviews, our breakdowns, analysts, macro guys. We got it all. We got it all right here on the channel. All right, so if you guys want to catch me, it is out there on Twitter at Paul Barron. Watch out for the scammers too. There's only at Paul Barron. That's it. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.